I'm Daria Fischer. I work at the same department that the school is being organized, but, but this talk is not going to be about the work that I do at the department. It's going to be about uh, my side job, which I'm doing as the director of user involvement within a European uh, research infrastructure called Clarin. And Klein is one of the uh, funders of this summer school, so we decided to tell you a little bit about it. Uh, Klein is not devoted to machine translation as such, so this topic will be slightly outside your core program of the summer school. Uh, but I will try to give you a background and an insight into what Klein can do for you. And I will also try and show that we can support research with parallel corpora with a brief overview of what's available. Um, okay, so basically Clary is providing an infrastructural support for the study and use of language data as a source of social and cultural information and knowledge. Uh, infrastructure is very much like you know, the highways, the electricity, the water supply, that's the infrastructure that we're talking about. But researchers um, need other types of infrastructure uh, rather than just the uh, physical infrastructure. And Clarion is a somewhat less tangible infrastructure, but important nevertheless. Um, I have probably not given a very convincing opening to why we need infrastructure as researchers in linguistics, digital humanities, and social sciences. Um, so to start my talk, I decided to show you a more exciting video that will hopefully um, persuade you that this is important. Let me know if the sound is not loud enough. Let's start And doing my dissertation on anonymization and 
I was wondering if you had any data sets um, that are similar to mine that I could use in an autistic regression analysis. Okay, let's see. Um, so now we have you looked into tropic, and we have nominalization, we have nouns, we have logistic regression. Do you have any other keywords? Yeah, what uh, constructive languages. Okay. Yeah, you hit the jackpot. We actually have 22 studies that match your query. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm gonna... Just, just wait a second to beam them up, Sky. <laughs> Have you ever had similar struggle, struggles, either as the one looking for uh, data to be able to use for your own work, or the one providing data for others? Do you agree that the struggle is real, that the gap is indeed there? Yes. And uh, the metaphor for using money instead of research objects or resources, do you think this is an exaggeration? Not at all, right? It's very expensive to create resources. Sometimes even if you fail to collect data, they're gone forever. Either speakers die or the data gets lost and cannot be reproduced. So the awareness raising of the importance of building repositories of the existing resources and trying to maximize on the reuse of existing repositories is, is real and can have a very big impact on research and the society in general. And this is what Clarin is trying to do. Basically, we're trying to be a one-stop shop for all the language-related uh, data sets and tools. Let's now go back to the presentation. Um, this is um, what my talk is going to look like. First, I'll introduce Clarin to you. Probably you don't, you're not familiar with it um, very much. Uh, and then I will show the resources, how you can look for them, and uh, which parallel corpora are available through Clarin. And I will give a bit brief overview of the Clarin tools that we are currently proudest of. And I will try and persuade you and show you that depositing your own resources to Clarin is both easy and uh, useful. Okay, um, I don't want to bore you too much with uh, a background uh, on Clarin, but just in five most important points, Clarin is an acronym for Common Language Resources and Technology Infrastructure, Clarin. Uh, and it provides easy and sustainable access for researchers in a wide range of disciplines from humanities and social sciences um, to digital language data, in very different forms, written, spoken, video, and even multimodal form. Uh, in addition to the resources, we're trying to provide access to advanced tools to discover, explore, exploit, annotate, analyze, and combine language data wherever researchers and the resources are located. Um, we are also trying to provide an easy to access single sign-on online environment so that you only identify once with your institution <coughs> and then get granted access to everyone else in the network so that you don't have to identify to every single resource provider from scratch anytime you're trying to access their data. 
we have um, very different data types and we're trying to serve very different user communities, uh, ranging from newspaper archives, literary texts, parliamentary records, historical archives, uh, broadcast <laughs> archives, oral history data, social media data, and so on. In terms of users, we've had uh, users from the uh, broader fields of digital humanities, such as linguistics and philology. These are our most uh, devoted users. Uh, we've also had quite a lot of <coughs> translators and lexicographers interested in the uh, infrastructure, as well as literary studies. We're now trying to get um, historians who are on board, but also political and social scientists who are beginning to rely on large data sets for their own work, as well as media studies, culture, uh, folklore, anthropology researchers, speech therapists, teachers of language and related areas, as well as the general public citizen scientists, we like to call them nowadays. Um, this is a brief overview of the services that Clarin is offering. Um, this is a screenshot of our website, and I will go through um, each of the services briefly to tell you about what you can expect from Clarin. Um, first, you can uh, read on the Clarin portal uh, good examples of projects that have been successfully completed using Clarin infrastructure. Um, in a user-friendly way, with lots of visualizations, reports on results, and so on. Um, you can read this to become inspired or to get an idea uh, about your new next project. Then we are offering a very important service, which is the depositing service, uh, where you can deposit your own material that you've collected. I will talk about this in detail at the end of my talk, so I will skip it. Now, uh, this is our most prominent service, the Virtual Language Observatory, which I will also demonstrate. This is like a Google um, search engine for language resources. This is your entry point whenever you're trying to identify, find a resource that you would like to use. In the background, um, we have uh, easy access to protected resources, while we are trying to promote open science and uh, open licenses, we are aware of certain limitations that are real and are not going to go away with certain resources which just cannot be shared as open <coughs> access data. Uh, we are still welcoming those, but we are providing an elegant way of um, sharing, disseminating slightly less open data sets through the easy access where you identify yourself, you get access through your uh, credentials by your home institution or you get a, a special password in a, in a single environment. Um, in addition to resources, uh, we are also trying to <coughs> increasingly offer web services and applications to process language data. This is still very much in development, so please bear with us for a while until we've um, come a far way, uh, far enough to impress you. Um, while we are already quite proud of the applications that we're offering for English and German, there are still many languages, including many of yours in this uh, summer school, that are under-supported, for example, Slovenian. We're working hard to try and integrate uh, language uh, uh, tools as web services for smaller languages now. This is our current uh, development effort. Uh, we are uh, enabling you to cre create virtual collections. If you find materials in different sites, on different locations that you would like to combine and use as a single collection, you can do this in our virtual collections uh, tab. Um, we also offer a catalog of existing resources, the language resource inventory we call it, where we can store and you can find uh, existing uh, resources, uh, uh, records of existing resources, even when they are not deposited to our uh, repository just yet. 
we are also playing with developing uh, a unified federated, we call it, content search uh, facility where through the same access point you could search in all the corpora in our repository. So you, you again perform like a Google search and you get hits from all the available resources that we have in the repository. And this final question mark are our consulting services. We have staff available through our client centers that can help you out if you have any questions or would like uh, help support with accessing, using or depositing your language resources. Um, Clarin is a subscription-based um, initiative. Um, we currently have 19 members uh, all over Europe and two observer countries. Um, and subscription membership is per country basis. So if your government, if the ministry pays annual membership fee, all its citizens are automatically members of Clarin. Since Slovenia, for example, has paid membership fee for uh, Clarin, all Slovenians can access and use the uh, infrastructure as if they are equal members to anyone else in the network. Um, we have over 40 Clarin centers in the network and not all of them are in Europe, they are also in the United States, for example. Um, they are certified centers that can guarantee long-term access to your data even when your project is long over or if you switch jobs, your resources will still be guaranteed uh, available accessible through the Clarin Center. What do Clarin Centers offer? So Clarin is a network, is a distributed network of many nodes which are called centers and uh, each of these centers offer their own repository uh, which is basically a library of linguistic data and tools uh, they enable search for that data and tools uh, available online as well as a functionality of you to contact them and deposit your data with them. Um, all client centers offer uh, the federate, federated single sign-on option so that you can get uh, a login and access uh, to all the data in the repository and then you can also use this to access uh, data and repositories from other client centers. Um, we are very big on metadata. Metadata is the additional information that is supplied with your language resources that describe how your resource was collected, how big it was, which language it is, uh, in, um, what are the sources, uh, how it was processed, and so on. Um, these help you identify and find the relevant resources but also enable you to use it for research because you cannot use uh, a data set that you don't know how it was created or manipulated because then this could have a major impact on your research results. Not only that, what we're very proud of is that we're uh, offering persistent identifiers or pins uh, or handles <coughs> Um, which is like a DOI, do you know DOI with publications? If you create a project and you create a website uh, and then the project is over uh, and you stop paying for your domain, the website will go away and anyone trying to find your uh, corpus, your resource, uh, will be stuck because the link is broken, right? Persistent identifiers make sure that the link is permanent forever available and doesn't change. So when you want to refer to a resource or cite it, it's very easy to do that and it's never broken. Uh, so this is a very good advantage to depositing your data with Clarin infrastructure rather than putting it on your own website. What we're also uh, good at doing is providing help with license licensing. While we are trying to uh, promote public licenses, we're also um, offering academic licenses that are restricted to only researchers 
not, for example, for-profit companies, uh, but also more restricted licenses that are um, needed for some more sensitive data, for example, if you're doing research on young children or on victims of sexual abuse, you can never open this data up and you can uh, rely on restricted licenses. Uh, a very important point of each client center is that they have a data seal of approval, they have gone through a process uh, in which uh, they have proved that they are committed to long-term care of all the items in the repository and that they can assure that data can be archived and found uh, and used in the future even if formatting changes, even if technology changes, they will take care of that for your data, free of charge. Okay, let's now move on to the resources. This is what we're here for. Um, I would like to emphasize that we are uh, making available all types of different resources, not just corpora, but corpora is something that we're most proud of. We are offering access to different families of corpora, like newspaper corpora, parliamentary corpora, reference corpora, and so on. Because you were uh, at a machine translation summer school, I decided to uh, showcase uh, parallel corpora because they are the most relevant for you. You're probably only focusing on machine translation, but parallel corpora uh, really have a great potential for being used uh, in many different fields of uh, humanities and social sciences. Uh, they are good for close reading when you can compare each translation uh, to its source sentence but also for distance reading, where can you take the whole bulk of the database uh, and uh, process it to get uh, some uh, extracted results. Um, apart from machine translation, uh, social sciences uh, are increasingly looking at parallel data to explore social and cultural dynamics, political scientists, uh, are looking into the JRC uh, parallel corpora, for example, European documents, economics, and so on. But in the humanities, um, the traditional fields uh, that are taking uh, a look at parallel corpora in, in, in uh, combination with translation studies are contrastive and comparative linguists, as well as L1 and L2 teachers. Um, Parallel uh, corpora are considered a very rich data type because apart from pure linguistic content, it is also rich in metadata and extra linguistic cues. By metadata, what I'm trying to say is that you can extract who the speaker is and the characteristics of the speaker and you can analyze this data in a different way. In terms of extra lingu linguistic clues, there are also non-textual content types uh, available in the corpora, links to other um, locations on the internet, uh, images. Um, they can also be uh, there can also be, for example, interruptions in parliamentary speeches, um, carefully encoded in the data, and so on. Um, the problem with parallel corpora is that they are often considered messy or noisy, right? Especially the large data collections, parallel corpora, uh, sometimes are not 100% parallel, right? Sometimes um, people create parallel corpora from the web. They cannot guarantee that each source and target sentence are full translations of of the source sentence. Sometimes they are called closely parallel or, or uh, comparable data. Um, but sometimes it's also important that we are aware um, that parallel data, if it is not created in written form, uh, needs um, links to other modalities uh, rather than text, for example, speech or visual processing. Uh, parallel data, other than most other resources, um, has been created under very specific circumstances that needs to be understood uh, before researchers can make strong conclusions based on them. For example, what is the status of the source and target <coughs> language? For example, in many multilingual parallel corpora available on Clarin, it is not clear which language is the source language and which language is the text was translated into. 
it's only clear which languages are available in this particular data set, but not what is the status of the source and target languages. So this makes it hard for some types of research. Um, there are two ways of how you can access uh, corpora, parallel corpora, uh, through the Clarin infrastructure. One easy way is that you take a look at our map, locate your nearest Clarin center or a specialized Clarin center that is doing what you're interested in, um, and use their repository. I am showing you a screenshot of the Slovenian Clarin repository, it's called Clarin C, which has a very simple search window uh, where you can enter the name or the keywords of the um, corpus that you're looking for. If you would like a, a browsing facility or a more advanced search, you can rely on the advanced search um, options where you can uh, select or browse resources according to several categories. For example, the language of the resource is specifically encoded in the metadata, subject, access rights, authors, and so on. Um, I have filtered in the advanced search window for corpora that are pa parallel, and I'm displaying an overview um, of the languages that Slovenia, the Slovenian uh, resource is offering in terms of parallel corpora, for Serbian, Slovenian parallel corpora, to Bulgarian, Croatian, Czech, Estonian, Hungarian, and Romanian, and uh, one of Finnish, German, or Spanish, and so on. In terms of subject of interest, Four of these parallel corpora on the Slovenian repository are web corpora, so crawled from the web. Um, two have been manually annotated, two are in the TEI format, one corpus has annotated errors, translation errors in them, one is used in machine translation, one in post-editing, um, one tagging, and we have uh, topics such as Slavic languages and tourism represented as well. Of these corpora, uh, five are published under the academic license, which means that everyone affiliated with an academic institution can get access to them, and three are publicly available through an open source license. This means that even companies or uh, people not affiliated with any uh, academic institution can download the corpora and use them. Um, I just want to show you two uh, two types of the resources that have been uh, found through this search query. One in, is an example of, a, of an academic use corpus, which is called a Tourism English-Croatian Parallel Corpus. I chose this one because I heard yesterday that there are some people from Croatia here, and because they don't have a Clarin Center in Croatia, we are depositing a lot of their resources on their behalf as well. Um, this was a corpus created by uh, crawling something like 25, 30 websites of biggest tourist, uh, tourism institutions um, and are stored in parallel format. Uh, you, uh, because it's a restricted uh, license to academic use, you first have to identify yourself with your home institution and then you can grant, uh, get granted access to download the data. So for people studying at uh, University of Ljubljana, for example, basically you need to affiliate yourself and then you get a downloadable click. Uh, another example of a parallel corpus available through the Slovenian repository is a pair corpus, which is a post-edited and error annotated machine translation corpus um, that was done by uh, two colleagues of ours. It's available in several language combinations, including Slovenian. Um, and this one is publicly available, so if you want, you can access it right now as you're hearing me speak. You can basically download it with two clicks. Okay, uh, sometimes you don't know which client center you're looking for, you're interested in. And in this case, you can visit the VLO, as we call it, or the Virtual Language Observatory. 
this is the uh, centralized uh, search um, option uh, to look for resources regardless of which clearing center they are deposited with. Um, the search looks very similar, but you're not searching for any repository per se, you're searching through metadata that is automatically collected by this search functionality. So I input parallel corpus, and because I got too many hits, I limited my search results to resources uh, that uh, make English as one of the languages available through the metadata information and um, the resources that are publicly available. And based on these filters, I get 28 hits. And this is one example, English Czech corpus uh, made from Wikipedia. We have Czech participants of this summer school. That's why I picked it. You have a brief description of the resource. And this is, this is automatically generated based on the metadata collected from all the clarin centers. So a brief description of the parallel corpus, um, all the metadata that are provided, and a link to directly download the corpus. So in this case, because the corpus is publicly available, you don't even need to do any um, identification through your affiliation or anything like that. You can just automatically go ahead and download the TXT. This particular corpus has a source, uh, one line with a source sentence, and then the, on the next line there's a target sentence. In terms of an overview, I um, did a, like a mini survey for you, um, and I have been able through the VLO search query um, identify 47 different corpora. Uh, of very different uh, language combinations. Most European languages uh, are covered with at least one resource, um, if nothing else, something coming from the European Union, but also other languages, sometimes quite exotic, like Telugu or Hindi. Or um, most corpora uh, uh, fall into the legal admin domain from uh, EU uh, text sources, a lot of the corpora uh, are created based on Wikipedia. Many corpora are crawled from the web, but there are also parallel corpora of newspaper collections, fiction texts, uh, technical uh, reports, and so on. You need to be careful when you're before deciding to use these corpora, because sometimes many of them are quite small, like 100,000 uh, sentences but some go to uh, as high as one billion words. Um, in terms of availability, uh, of these that I have been able to find, most are available for uh, download um, and are available under a CC BY license. Uh, I have provided a link to a Google spreadsheet table with all the hits that I have identified. Um, the link is available here, so if you would like to go through each and every resource that I have been able to find, you can click here, I will share my uh, presentation with you and you can explore the table. If you know of any other resources that we have not included, uh, send me an email, I'll be happy to try and provide um, an extensive comprehensive overview of the resources. Uh, if you're not really happy with what you find on Clarin, um, it is not all hopeless because there are three other nice um, venues for finding the resources that you might be looking for. Uh, the first one is Metashare, which is a network of repositories for language uh, data and resources and all European research projects uh, publish information there. Um, this is a good venue for finding resources that are not yet integrated with Clarin and for researchers who are not yet joined uh, in Clarin. Another good uh, opportunity if you're looking for new resources is the uh, Language Resources and Evaluation Map, which is a, a biannual conference. Every two years they uh, organize the biggest conference in language resources domain. Uh, and in addition to um, papers, 
they also collect information about the resources that were collected. Um, these are uh, mostly research-oriented or data sets um, and uh, often um, on specialized domains. But the good news here is that they are very new, so at least uh, in, from the last two years. You can find new resources here. And the third option is to um, uh, take a look at the archives of the corporal list mailing list where you can find um, information about the most recent releases by different research teams. Okay, I would like to now move on to how much time do I have left? Not a lot, um, so I will be fast here. I would like to show you two types of tools that we are making available to researchers. They're quite mature, so they are ready to be used. They're not directly use, usable for um, transla machine translation company or for, for people who want to do machine translation as, as a production, but they are very useful for researchers looking into machine translation ph phenomena. Uh, because about half of the group <coughs> is also research oriented, I've decided to show you that. Um, uh, the, the tool that we are very proud of for manual annotation of language data is called WebAnna. It was developed within the German CLARIN uh, team. It's a very general purpose uh, manual annotation tool that is online. So you don't need to install anything. You need to learn how to unpack, how to install, how to uh, set up any machinery. You just get, uh, log in to WebAnna and you uh, create projects there. Um, what is good about WebAnna is that it offers um, big annotation projects where you can annotate uh, the same project with many of your students or colleagues. Uh, and you have uh, support in terms of tracking uh, inter-annotation agreement, curation procedures, and so on. You can even monitor, like a big brother sort of um, supervisor, um, how far students are coming along or how quality their annotation is. Why would we want to manually annotate data? For a number of ways, um, pure language data or just part of speech tag language data is not enough for uh, our, most of our research purposes. Sometimes we would like to perform a more detailed analysis or validate our theories or get feedback on problematic uh, language cases. Um, there are also many opportunities to improve language technologies uh, that are out there with manually annotated data sets uh, to test uh, annotation tools or to train annotation tools or to automatically generate lexica and so on. There are also practical benefits for ma from manual annotation. For example, you can then easily search your phenomena by categories, get nice examples from them, and also ensure that your uh, data and your annotations are uh, usable for other research uh, purposes in a long-term way. Um, the best features of the tool is, uh, are that the tool is very flexible, um, it's a team-based tool, it's an online tool, and it's open to everyone. This is the annotation workflow. Someone, a project manager, sets, the, sets up the project. Um, they uh, select a team of annotators, or the crowd, who annotate documents. Uh, the annotation uh, administrator uh, monitors the progress <laughs> of the project and then at the end curates or referees the annotators' results. So for example, they compare annotators and if the annotators disagree, they correct the mistakes or they decide on the final annotation. After the uh, annotation is performed, you simply export the data set that is then available in the ready format. I will skip the technical details of WebAnna. I just want to show you that you can test WebAnna without any installation uh, online with a demo version. You can download it to your machine or you can install a, um, a server license. 
Uh, in terms of annotation layers, you can select words or phrases, you can annotate spans of text, you can annotate relations of text, like syntactic dependencies or so on, as well as chains. Uh, these, these are some examples of good annotation projects that have been done with WebAnno. For example, non-standard German was annotated, um, what deviates from the norm. Um, less uh, linguistic uh, tasks such as job ad parsing can also be performed through WebAnno. So that you can automatically go through all the job ads and select your perfect candidate for the next job. Um, you can do semantic annotation, you can annotate speech, you can annotate multi-word expression, or even uh, complex structures like dialogue ads or biomedical entities. This is how monitoring the Big Brother sort of um, admin uh, view looks like. You can see for each annotator and for each file how far along they've come and what the inter-annotation agreement is. And this is an example of the curation phase. Uh, the, all the sentences in red boxes uh, show that the annotators disagreed with the tags, with the annotations that they added to the sentence. So you can easily compare one, uh, one annotator's uh, work and the others. And by just clicking on the correct annotation, you then just approve the correct annotation. Uh, I provided the links for help and support if you're interested in web ammo. Uh, and now I want to switch to a different type of tool, which is not uh, meant for manual annotation, but for automatic annotation. It's called WebLift, and it's the most mature workflow uh, for automatic annotation for naive users like you and me who are not NLP experts. You can upload your text select the annotation tool that you want to use and the tool will annotate uh, and offer the results uh, for you once it's done. You might want to add that, as far as I know, this is only for monolingual control. This is not for particle. The web page does not do any alignment or anything. Uh, sentence alignment is not supported, but you can se uh, sentence align offline and pr uh, process the rest of the data with web page. Um, you can uh, see, since it was developed by the German team, most of what's offered now is still available uh, for German only, and English, of course, but we're uh, adding basic tools for many other languages as we speak, including Slovene. So for many languages, you will have the basic tools like part of speech tagging, lemmatization, which are important for any type of other uh, more complex NLP processing. And then for the bigger languages, we even have advanced tools such as name entity resolution or word sentence ambiguation and so on. Um, if you would like your language to be supported, I urge you to contact your local clarin representative and try and get them on board. This is something that we are uh, trying to achieve in the coming year. This is uh, basically the workflow. You can copy paste or uh, uh, copy a, a URL or upload a document. Uh, you choose easy or advanced mode. Easy is a preset annotation tool chain. Advanced mode, you can fiddle with what stages uh, of annotation you would like to perform. And uh, then um, have everything processed. Uh, this is the output. Uh, in this particular um, example, I annotated uh, an English text from the Guardian um, with part of speech tags and lemmas, and you get a tabulated uh, format that is then easy to use in most other um, processing programs. I also provided help and support links so that you can read about uh, WebLift offline. Uh, and have just for motivation purposes uh, shown that if WebLift itself doesn't pro uh, support a language, maybe you can explore national clearing centers where most of the uh, languages um, have some basic annotation support locally. Slovenian has it, this is a Danish example, uh, the Dutch is well supported. 
check, and so on. Okay, and now finally, very quickly, how you can deposit the resources that you will be developing to Clarin. There are basically nine easy steps. First, you log in. <laughs> Uh, you start a new submission, and then, very important, you describe your item in as much detail as possibly can. You upload your file, you choose the license you want to distribute your resource with. You can leave a note to the admin that will uh, then try and reply and help you with. Then you have a, a phase where you need to review your submission, and then you submit. Um, it's, it looks very easy. The important uh, steps are three and four, where, where it's really important that you describe your metadata carefully. And in six, uh, selecting the license that is appropriate for your data. So if you don't have rights to share it as an open license, please don't, right? because you're violating <coughs> copyright. I just want to... Uh, uh, spread, express the advantages of why it's important to deposit uh, your data through Clarin because it's completely free of charge and if you need support you can ask for help through the help desk. Mm, it's very safe, we respect your license, your resources will be easy to find by other researchers so that they give you maximal visibility of your work and your resource will also be very easy to cite, uh, so that you will be credited for work, and other people would be able to expand on your work, improve your data. So you don't have any disadvantages, just an advantage. And I would just like to finish with um, an improved um, uh, Latin <coughs> spelling, very, very clear. Thank you very much.